There are four forces acting on an airplane that every pilot should know. Thrust propels the aircraft forward. Weight, or gravity, pulling the aircraft down. And lift is the aerodynamic force keeping a plane airborne, and we cover that in this video. But there's one last force acting on a plane that needs its own dedicated video, and that's drag. Want to know what causes it and how it affects flight? Then keep watching. We know that an aircraft's engine produces thrust to get the aircraft moving and pushing air over the wings. Drag is going to be anything that works against that thrust. The most obvious form of drag is going to come from things protruding from the aircraft's body, like landing gear. This is why many aircraft designers go through the trouble and added cost of adding a mechanism to retract that landing gear. We want all the speed that we can get not only to get us to our destination more quickly, but also to help us generate lift. This form of drag is known as parasite or parasitic drag. It gets this name because it in no way functions to aid flight. So it acts like a parasite and only takes away without providing anything useful. You might hear about several subtypes of parasite drag, but the important thing to remember is that they cause drag by interfering with the smooth airflow around the aircraft. And one key fact we want to remember about parasite drag is that its effects grow stronger as speed increases. Like this. This is an important factor that differentiates parasite drag from our next form, which is a byproduct of something useful, lift. The second less obvious form of drag is known as induced drag. It's sometimes called lift-induced drag, which better explains what it's doing. Let's think back to how lift is generated. Under the wing, we have a high pressure area, and above it, we have low pressure. This means the air wants to flow up to the top. Air flows like a fluid, and just like a fluid, it'll follow the path of least resistance, which takes it up around the wing tips. Once it runs into the overwing flow, it gets pushed to the rear, or it cycles back into the underwing flow and repeats the cycle again. This entire cycle ends by tracing a circular pattern behind the wing. We can see this process in action with this crop duster. The spray is shaped into a vortex created by the spinning air in its wake. This vortex has the added side effect of shaping the flow of air coming over the wing and producing downwash. The air flows then angle downward because of this effect. It's important to remember this downward angling of the flow since it's the entire reason induced drag exists. The pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge tells us why in this quote, lift is always perpendicular to the relative wind. This means the wingtip vortex and its corresponding downwash actually pushes the direction of lift, or lift vector, backward. Even in level flight, it's not pointed in the exact opposite direction of gravity, but slightly to the rear. So part of our lift is actually fighting against the force of thrust. Since it goes counter to thrust, it's a form of drag, and we call it induced drag. There are a couple things to remember about induced drag. One is that it's dependent on angle of attack. Induced drag goes up with AOA. That's because rotating the aircraft backward away from the direction of travel also rotates the lift factor backwards. Lift is fighting against thrust here. So at low speeds where you need more AOA to maintain lift, you're going to see more induced drag. And when you're flying faster, you need less AOA for the same lift. So you'll see less induced drag. It looks like this. Induced drag is the reason why fighters in a tight-turning dogfight are constantly losing speed, and it only gets worse as the plane slows down. When you combine induced drag with parasite drag, you end up with a chart like this. Changing speed will make one type of drag go up while the other goes down. Right here where the lines meet is where the combined drag is lowest. You'll hear it referred to as LD max, which means the maximum lift to drag ratio. As its name implies, this is the speed where you get the least amount of total drag. Knowing the speed for an aircraft is useful for maximizing range, endurance, climb angle, and glide range. Every aircraft will have a velocity that maximizes each of these values printed in its manual. Don't forget that angle of attack and speed have a close relationship, so it's not uncommon for an airplane to have this value shown on the AOA indicator. In this example, we see this triangle which shows us the angle of attack for maximum range. And this rectangle is for maximum endurance. Now you might be wondering, what's the difference between endurance and range? Max range is the highest ratio of fuel usage compared with speed. In other words, where you get the greatest amount of ground distance covered for your fuel. Maximum endurance is about time, not distance. 
so it's the lowest fuel usage that will keep you in safe level flight. You won't go as far as you would with maximum range speed, but if you need to stay over an area for an extended period of time, then this speed would be best. There is one other thing to remember about induced drag, and that's the fact that it's less pronounced near the ground. That's because the downwash is shaped by the surface of the earth. The wingtip vortex will be smaller and the angle of the downwash will be less too. This means that the lift factor isn't pushed as far back as it would be at a higher altitude. We call this phenomenon the ground effect. Remember that lift is perpendicular to the relative wind. So when the earth's surface flattens that relative wind, it's pushing the lift factor closer to straight up. Aircraft designers have known about induced drag for a long time and have come up with ways to reduce its effect. One way is to add small winglets which move the vortex farther out and reduce its effects. Another design feature that reduces induced drag is a high aspect ratio wing. When we talk about the wing aspect ratio, we're talking about the ratio between the wingspan and the wing's front to back measurement, which is called its cord. This is the same cord that we talked about in the How Lift Works video. You can also get the aspect ratio by taking the square of the wingspan and dividing it by the wing area. The number you get tells you roughly how the wing is shaped. This glider is an example of high wing ratio because its wingspan is far larger than its cord. For this particular glider, we see a lift to drag ratio of 56. This second glider has an even more extreme aspect, and so its lift to drag ratio is even higher at 70. The aspect ratio of this Piper Cherokee is a more moderate 5.6 and this Concorde has a very low aspect ratio of 1.55. Then there are some planes like the F-14 and the F-111 which can change their aspect ratio in flight. So this leads to an interesting question. If high aspect ratio reduces induced drag, then why aren't all wings high aspect? The answer is simple. Increasing aspect also increases parasite drag. That's because you have more of the wing hanging out in the airflow. And we know that parasite drag increases with speed. So high performance aircraft want low aspect ratios to keep that parasite drag low. Aircraft that mostly operate at slow speeds, like gliders, are better off with a high aspect ratio. Altogether, the different forces acting on an aircraft will look like this. Lift and weight are linked together in the vertical axis, while drag and thrust are linked horizontally but we already saw how sometimes these forces can cross over and affect each other on different axes, like when changing thrust affects lift. We'll go over some other ways these forces interact later on when we cover aerobatic maneuvers. But next up, we're going to learn how to try out a new plane for free in DCS and how to start it up and taxi with it. That'll be our first step in our journey where we'll put into practice the concepts we've covered so far. So I hope you'll come back for that one, and thanks for watching.